Hello, everyone. Just going to give a few minutes as usual just to get everybody uh, logged on and ready to go. Seeing a lot of people trickling in, so we'll just uh, give it another minute or two. Give it a few more seconds. All right, Aaron, if you're ready, I'm ready. We'll uh, get going with our introductions. And uh, yeah, that way we can just have everybody kind of come in as we go. Yeah. OK, um, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, and welcome to the Invasive Species Center uh, webinar series. My name is Jenna White, and I'm a Program Development Coordinator with the Invasive Species Center, and I will be your moderator for today. Um, so before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that the Invasive Species Center uh, honors the long history of the First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples on the lands now known as Canada, and strives to show respect uh, to their ancestors, their communities, and to them individually. Uh, we greatly appreciate the significance of the land, waters, and all living things, and offer our gratitude to the Indigenous people for their care, teachings, and teachings about our Earth. Our relationship with Indigenous peoples um, are important, and we will continue to listen and learn at how we can improve that relationship uh, with Indigenous peoples, the lands, waters, and in all living things, and act accordingly. The Invasive Species Centre respectfully acknowledges that our head office is located on the traditional lands of the Anishinaabek, the Batchewana, and Garden River First Nations, as well as the long settlement of the Métis people in the Robinson Huron Treaty area. Uh, today, I'm speaking to you from the city of Sudbury, which is the traditional lands of the Atikamekshing and Anishinaabeg. And I would also encourage you to have a look at our updated land acknowledgement page with an Ojibwe land acknowledgement translation and a photo of a beautiful a piece of art uh, created for the Invasive Species Center by Lucia Laporte. Um, and so the Invasive Species Center, if you're not aware, is a non-for-profit organization that connects uh, stakeholders' knowledge and technology to prevent the introduction and spread of invasive species that harm Canada's environment, economy, and society. Um, and so we'll, just a quick plug on our website, we've got lots of great resources uh, on invasive species, including species profiles, best management practices, and so much more. Uh, so check us out at invasivespeciescenter.ca. Um, and this actually includes a number of new profiles that were recently published, uh, such as oxygen weed, nutria, house sparrow, and akutsu, among others. Um, so we've got all the resources to keep you up to date. Uh, so have a look uh, when you get a moment. Um, we also uh, encourage you to sign up for our newsletter, um, a bi-weekly media scan and event invitations, which you can hear about upcoming webinars such as this one. Um, and uh, exciting news for the Invasive Species Center. We've also launched a new invasive species training program that offers virtual courses on topics related to invasive species. Um, so we currently have three courses available two of which focus on forest invasives and one on spotted lanternflies. So make sure to check out our website uh, to receive those updates. And before we get started today, uh, just a couple of things I would like to remind you about. Um, there will be time for questions at the end of the webinar. So if you have a question at any time, please leave it in the Q&A function. Um, and so this you know, function is a bit different from the chat function. It just helps us organize our questions. So please try to put them in there if you can. If you're having technical difficulties at any time, please type them in the chat box or respond to uh, the email where your registration uh, link came and we'll try to resolve it for you. Uh, we've also enabled closed captioning. So if you'd like to follow along that way, you can turn it on uh, on your taskbar. And lastly, there will be a brief survey uh, following the webinar. So if you could take some time to fill it out, we would really appreciate it. And today uh, our webinar is titled How uh, Humans Have Affected the Spread of Zebra Mussels with Aaron Sanchez. Um, so Aaron is a graduate student at Pennsylvania State University in the MGIS program, uh, and today she's presenting her capstone project to finish her degree, so we all get to be part of that, which is great. Uh, she received her undergraduate degree from Montana State uh, University in, in Billings uh, in biology with environmental science and enjoys exploring uh, the biological side of geography. 
She currently lives outside of Austin, Texas and works as a senior GIS technician for One Gas, a natural gas company. And in her free time, she enjoys uh, plenty of time outdoors with her family and baking treats for her kids. So it's my pleasure to pass uh, the mic to Erin um, and I'll, uh, yeah, let you go ahead, Erin. Hello, um, let me just start sharing my screen here. Alrighty. So hello, I wanted to uh, thank everyone for um, tuning in to listen today. And um, let's talk about how humans have affected the spread of zebra mussels. What is a zebra mussel? A zebra mussel is a small bivalve mollusk that ranges in size from 1 8 inch to 2 inches long. They're mostly white or cream colored with jagged brown or, or black stripes like a zebra. A more unique trait of a zebra mussel are their strong bissel threads. These threads are strong bonds. These threads form strong bonds to several types of substrates, including metal, glass, wood, aquatic plants, other crustaceans, and even each other. Zebra mussels can filter around one quart of water daily, making them fairly, very efficient filter feeders for their small size. They thrive in fresh, moderate, temperatured water that is two to 12 meters deep, but can live much deeper up to about 110 meters deep. They have sol They must have a solid surface in their environment to attach to in order to survive to maturity. A result of this is that zebra mussels have become creative in what they can attach to. One of the first questions when talking about an invasive species is how did they come to be here? It is suspected that zebra mussels came to the US in ballast water from a transatlantic cargo ship. They are indigenous to Eastern Europe and Western Asia and have been present in freshwater systems in Europe, Scandinavia, and Russia for hundreds of years. They made their first appearance in the US during the late 1980s in the Great Lakes Basin. This time-lapse map shows the spread of zebra mussels from their first recorded count to 20, 2021, using data produced from the non-indigenous aquatic species website from the USGS. Zebra mussels were released on the north side of Lake Erie in 1987. Over the next four years, they populated the Great Lakes region and extended up the St. Lawrence River into Ontario, where they would later spread as far north as Quebec. In 1992, zebra mussels had been found in the Hudson, the Illinois, the Ohio, and the Tennessee rivers. They made it down the entire journey of the Mississippi River and were recorded in the Missis Mississippi River Delta in 1994. Over the next decade, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Nebraska would all see their rivers and lakes populated by zebra mussels as well. Over the next few years, zebra mussels made the jump to Colorado, Utah, Texas, and even California. The most recent population expansions have been in Minnesota and North and South Dakota. Currently, there are zebra mussel populations in at least 33 states. As you can see, zebra mussels spread quickly and can reproduce in large numbers. But what makes zebra mussels invasive? An invasive species is non-native non to their ecosystem and whose introduction to a native population causes environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. When zebra mussels invade an ecosystem, they filter feed an immense amount of water. This sounds like a good thing, but by over filter feeding, zebra mussels create an environment with increased water clarity and scarce plankton, which can lead to a change in the ecosystem's food web. With increased water clarity, Fish habitats change, causing some fish to seek deeper water and others to decrease in numbers. More light in the water column also increases aquatic plant growth. Overgrowth of aquatic plants can become challenging for boaters or swimmers and also changes fish habitat. With the mussels' ability to filter so much water and their high reproduction numbers, they outcompete native species Zebra mussels do filter toxins in, in the water, but those toxins get stored inside them. When they're eaten by other wildlife, 
they can harm them with their toxicity. One of the unique parts of a zebra mussel are their strong bissel threads. These threads form strong attachments to most solid surfaces. Since zebra mussel villagers or larvae are free swimming and microscopic, they have the ability to get themselves into problematic places, attach and grow. Damage and fouling of infrastructure due to zebra mussels is a billion dollar a year problem in the US. Mussels can attach and grow in water intake pipes and irrigation systems, blocking water flow and decomposing water lines. Hydroelectric plants and dams have costs associated with removing mussels from pipes and structures and maintenance to keep them from reattaching. Attachments to ships and boats can cause problems with drag and erosion of the hulls and engine problems. Buoys and other structures require more maintenance to remove mussels in order to function properly. Zebra mussels will also attach to crustaceans and other aquatic plants and animals in their environment. Lastly, zebra, zebra mussels leave behind invasive waste. They filter feed most organisms they come across but they don't consume filamentous algae like blue-green algae. This promotes blue-green algae growth and can cause toxic algae blooms. The decomposition of zebra mussels consumes ox dissolved oxygen in the water. When there is a large event of a die-off, the amount of oxygen in the mussels, the amount of oxygen the mussels consume has an effect on other organisms in the environment. Another result from a large die-off event are windrows of zebra mussel shells that wash up on shorelines of lakes. Because the shells are sharp and small, it makes some lake fronts unusable during these events. Zebra mussels seem to be able to come into a, a variety of environments and thrive quickly. When looking at their spread pattern, it is important to differentiate between a natural spread and a spread caused by events of humans transporting these well-known hitchhikers. For a zebra mussel to naturally move to a new area, they rely on a few key points. Zebra mussels can't swim, so their movement would have to come, would have to be along the current of a river. Due to their larvae being so extremely small, it is also possible for them to be transported by other animals like birds or small mammals. For their preferred habitat, the, mu the mussels thrive best in water with a depth of around two to 12 meters, they prefer freshwater environments, but have been known to survive in slightly brackish water. A water temperature of 68 to 77 degrees Fahrenheit is preferred for mature zebra mussels. And when the temperatures drop over the winter, it helps to facilitate reproduction. A dissolved calcium level of around 12 parts per million allows larvae and villagers to thrive. As with all things, they need to have access to their preferred food source, which is phytoplankton, and they need to have a solid surface to attach to. Several years ago, a paper was published by John Drake and Jonathan Bosenbrock, where they looked at the potential distribution of zebra mussels across the United States. They used six major environmental factors, annual temperature, frost frequency, annual precipitation, solar radiation, and minimum maximum temperatures, along with five physical factors, bedrock geology, elevation, flow accumulation, slope, and surface geology. With all these considering factors, they used a genetic algorithm for rule setting production, known as GARP, several thousand times to produce these statistical maps that predict the zebra mussel's potential range across the United States. This is one of those maps they produced. Um, the dark purple areas represent environments that were predicted to have a higher likelihood of zebra mussels. And the black dots are the zebra mussel counts um, up to 2003. John, John Drake and Jonathan Bosenrock, Bosenrock created their map in 2004 and all the data using all the data available to them. When the data from the following years is added to their map, you can see that a good portion of the zebra mussels fall within their predicted range. There, the exceptions are the outlaying points in Kansas, Colorado, and Utah with the explosion activity in Minnesota. Zebra mussels 
can only move by water current or if they're transported. In this next animated map, it shows the spread sequence, um, but this time the purple highlighted points represent unnatural movement. This is movement that goes against the current of a river or watershed of the area, and it also includes new lake colonization. As the years progress in this map sequence, you can see the ebb and flow of natural and unnatural spread. Major leaps out of the Great Lakes include traveling to the Mississippi, south of Minneapolis, jumping down to the Ohio River, or across to the Hudson. These, after these events, there are a combination of natural spread down these major rivers and continued unnatural spread up them. The St. Lawrence holds a mostly natural spread pattern, but contributes to a natural spread by, um, by, zebra, mounts, by zebra mussel counts moving into the southern Ontario, moving into southern Ontario, Ontario and their lake systems there. In the early 2000s, we can see a jump into Kansas by traveling up the Arkansas River and even leaps over into Colorado, Utah, and Texas. The most likely way for many of these against the current spreads or large land spreads to occur is for zebra mussels attaching to water vessels, both commercial and recreational, and being transported to new areas. The next map I'm going to talk about was intended to be a little bit more comprehensive, but due to some data management errors where my original map got accidentally deleted, we're going to instead look at a snapshot of April 2015 Walker vessel traffic. This information was downloaded from the NOAA database and it shows cargo, tanker, and tugboat traffic in the Great Lakes region and the East Coast region, along with muscle with zebra mussel counts from 2015. When looking at this map, it can be related that commercial shipping did have an influence in the Great Lakes region and the Illinois and the Hudson and in the northern Chesapeake Bay area, but it doesn't really account for the nationwide spread. Most of the nationwide spread of zebra mussel seems to be attributed to recreational boating. Since recreational boating and canoeing is not something that we track, I don't have a map for this one. But I do think that this conclusion goes along well with the spirit of conservation, and that's that conservation is not led by corporations or large shipping productions, but by everyday people doing their part. Adult zebra mussels can survive on a small boat or paddle boat out, out, out of the water for as long as a week, and their microscopic larvae can be transported in even the smallest amounts of water. These maps that I've shared today have shown that once a colony is established in any recreational area where multiple lakes are close to each other, their spread, ex their spread explodes quickly. Even the large jumps between neighboring states can be attributed to people traveling out of state with their small boats and not realizing that they're transporting zebra mussels with them. The best control measure for anyone to take is to properly clean, wash, and dry any boat or water floats or toys that are used in areas no, that, with known zebra mussel counts. Cities also use um, hypochlorite systems to remove mussels from pipes. Larger boats and ships can, be, can use anti-fouling coating, which, can, which helps to stop zebra mussels from attaching. So this, physically removing zebra mussels is always also effective. There are areas, there are also areas where eco DNA tests can be seen, where um, zebra mussel DNA is tested in the water and it reveals if there's larva present. Alberta has also started a conservation canine project where dogs have been trained to sniff out zebra mussels during boat inspections. Invasive species enter an ecosystem, cause environmental and economic harm. Zebra mussels change the water column, outcompete native species, and create damaging waste products. They cause billions of dollars of damage to infrastructure and, and maintenance programs. As much as zebra mussels affect us, humans have had a large impact on their rate and range of spread. 
through commercial shipping. Though commercial shipping has brought them to North America, it is through responsible recreational boating and dil diligent control measures that will that will be able to slow the spread and allow e ecosystems to recover. Um, yeah, thanks, Erin. That was great. Um, so we do have uh, quite a bit of time for questions. If we want to, if anybody has anything that uh, we want to address, um, please feel free to add that into the chat function or the Q and A section. Um, but maybe to kick us off, um, you know, always interested to hear about communication uh, techniques to use to kind of influence um, public decision making. So hopefully, you can speak a little bit to your thoughts on, uh, you know increasing um, communications to, you know, make people aware of the, the changes and decision-making that they can make, um, you know, if you think that that's an effective technique or, or if you have any thoughts kind of on communications surrounding uh, super muscles. Yeah, so um, though a lot of people, um, a lot of people who are in biology or conservation or anything, most of them know about zebra mussels. A lot of people don't, like a lot of regular people. So having open communication and having signs available and having people know that they need to rinse and dry and the proper temperatures to use and all of those things um, really helps um, stop the spread and to keep it from, to keep mussels from jumping from lake to lake to lake. Yeah, absolutely. That's something that we definitely try to focus on uh, here in Ontario with Clean Drain Dry. Um, we actually have new regulations in place that make it mandatory to um, clean drain dry uh, your boat and empty those uh, plugs as well. Um, so we're we're trying to, our best over here <laughs> for that as well. Um, we do have a couple of questions that came in. Um, so uh, one of them, and it's a big one, so um, hoping you can help us uh, muddle through this, but how has climate change affected the spread of zebra mussels? Um, oh. if you have an answer to that, yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, I would say that with changing temperatures, any ambient changing temperature is going to change the temperature of the water. And I know that Texas had a really rough winter a couple years back. And so having that cold cycle that Texas and some of the Southern states aren't used to having could help, um, facilitate that breeding cycle that requires the temperatures to drop, which might be why a lot of those mussels are moving kind of in a southern region now, where before they were more of a northern region. Sure, yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Uh, thanks for your answer on that. Um, so we also have a couple more coming in. Do we know how the spread uh, of zebra mussels kind of initially started um, or where? Um, they think that it initially started um, in Lake Erie from ballast water from an international ship. So the ballast water was dumped into the lake. There was a zebra mussel inside and it just exploded from there. Yeah, definitely. And the conditions of the uh, of the water here definitely were suitable. So just, yeah, kind of seemed to, to keep going from there. Okay, um, we'll keep going. Um, are, is, are there ways uh, that we can decrease the populations in lakes that have already been, in lakes that have already uh, seen infestations of zebra mussels? Um, yes. So they do go in and physically will physically scrape off and remove zebra mussels. Um, some of the other techniques that they use, um, is that they'll lay sheets down on the base, on the base of the river or uh, the lake, and they'll allow the, all the mussels to attach to that sheet. And then they'll just pick the whole sheet up. Um, they also can use chemical means but they try not to. Physical is usually better. Yeah, they're definitely uh, not an easy one to get rid of, <laughs> especially being an, uh, an aquatic species. Um, what species of native mussels do zebras uh, most affect? And uh, that answer may be a bit different depending on where you are. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll let you kind of speak to that, Erin. Um, I would say that it is probably based on off of out of where you are, um, they affect most crustaceans. They they can take their they can change their environment and their um, food sources. But another funny thing that they do is that any of those crustaceans that have hard surfaces, 
um, they can attach to it and actually like um, kill it through it not being able to move because it's like covered. Um, so they definitely have an impact on other crustaceans. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and here in Canada as well, same uh, same idea. We definitely have a, a couple, you know, species at risk mussels that are impacted. So um, not a great thing. Um, so I'm I've got somebody who says that they're working from the the province of Quebec and would like to know what tools um, and campaigns we can use to encourage uh, voluntary actions to prevent uh, this introduction of uh, aquatic invasive species. So a little bit similar to the, to the initial question that we had there. Yeah. Um really knowledge just um putting out that they exist and that they travel more easily than you would anticipate um and that boats boats aren't always what's affected it can be they can get inside your fishing buckets they can get inside anything that has water in it could have zebra mussel larvae in it so it's really important to make sure everything is dried, all the toys are cleaned out, everything's good, especially if you're going to be moving to a different lake, if you're fishing or you're traveling around. Um, so really just knowledge and putting the word out is the best way to do it. Absolutely. Um, some really great conversation coming out of this. So thank you, Erin. Um, I'm glad you're on your toes with the answers. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, participating in clean, drain, dry, how should the wastewater be dealt with? Uh, thinking of clean drain dry on my uh, on my driveway and the wastewater goes into the sewer and then what happens you know um, maybe that's uh, something along the same lines you can uh, just discuss yeah so with clean drain dry um, one of the important things about it is water temperature so you're supposed to use pretty warm water and that warm water will kind of um, cook them <laughs> so that they don't, they're not able to reproduce or continue living. You also need to um, make sure that it is away from sewage systems that drain into natural water. Um, so I know that when you, you leave lakes, they have specified areas that they monitor where you do your clean drain dry um, that they know won't drain back into the lake. Sure. Um, thank you. Uh, so then uh, this one might be a little more specific. Um, so hoping you can maybe talk about how uh, zebra mussels have affected fish populations in the Great Lakes. Um, sure. I didn't look up specific um, fish populations, but I do, I did see that um, when they, when they come into an area and they filter feed all of that muck that's there that changes where fish will then exist so if they're the fish originally existed in a space that had a pretty moderate water column had moderate plants and then zebra mussels come in they'll change that so that there's lots of plants because they have lots of light and um, it can really dis disturb the fish to make them go deeper into the lake or to um, just eradicate that population yeah, it's a sad story. Um, lots of, uh, yeah, lots of ecosystem impacts and it's a trickle down effect, isn't it? So um, yeah, tough to, tough to hear that. Um, okay, so um, looking at, yeah, a similar question uh, in terms of climate change, will increasing temperatures in the summers due to climate change help decrease population uh, in your opinion? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> they never they said that um, the colder weather helped facilitate um, reproduction, but it never said that they didn't reproduce if it didn't get cold. And there was cases in Texas um, and Texas doesn't have real hard freezing winters. Um, and even down in Louisiana, where they don't really have very hard freezing winters either. Um, so it, it could help. Um, in those regions, it's possible. Sure. Um, and I, I'm wondering, based on your uh, maps, if you know the level of infestation in northern Ontario areas. Uh, our our base is in Sault Ste. Marie um, or Thunder Bay. I don't know if you uh, have any indication of, of how far they've come uh, in Canada. Um, yeah. I remember seeing points um, all the way up to Montreal, and then there were points that got through um, Quebec. So that's about as far as north as they went. Sure. 
Yeah, um, definitely uh, with the Great Lakes connections up there, it's that's not a good thing, sure. Um, so, yeah, um, just another question on um, calcium levels. So do you think low calcium levels have kept zebra mussels from spreading into the upper Tennessee and Southern Appalachians? We're, we're hitting every corner of uh, North America here. <laughs> Um, yes, uh, there there was some of literature that I read that um, calcium um, calcium concentrations actually were a limiting factor on where they were. If you look at some of the maps, you can see that they never quite go up um, into Maine or New Hampshire or Vermont, and that's because um, kind of like this solid line, um, and it's because the calcium levels we're kind of limiting the larva from being able to fully develop. So if um, if your area has calcium levels that were very, very low or very, very high, it could change how the larva are able to develop. Very interesting. Um, and so kind of on that uh, more biological vein, do you know if there is any biological control, uh, biocontrol research happening to target uh, zebra mussels? Have you come across that in your research? Um, I haven't yet. They, uh, the most biological, um, control factor would probably be the eco DNA, um, which is pretty cool and has lots of potential for growth. Um, and that's where they can take any water and they can test it for the DNA of, um, zebra mussels. And it can give you a quicker, um, answer on whether or not there's water present there or zebra mussels present in the water um but you know when they're sequencing all that they can it allows them to be able to develop that into having biological controls sure sounds sounds great and that's uh, something that we also do a little bit with uh, the invasive species center is, is edna research um and so looking to kind of increase um you know our knowledge and scope of of uh, yeah, just knowledge for invasive species because, uh, you know, especially with aquatics, they're really difficult to see and know that they're there um, unless you you look for them. So uh, that's that's really interesting. Um, in terms of, uh, we've got somebody from Manitoba asking, you know, zebra mussels are in most of Manitoba's waters. Can they be detoxified? And if so, how? Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. That would be a very specific question um, for that area uh like with with any area that has zebra mussels um it's a long process because all you need is one <laughs> one <laughs> left over and then it re it'll repopulate um so just continued conservation and being really diligent would help that absolutely um yeah, so another uh, question on uh, control. Um, or is there anything we can do once zebra mussels are established? I think we kind of covered that a little earlier about physical removal. Um, but if you want to just recap that, that would, might be helpful. Um, sorry, can you could you repeat sorry, the question yeah. one more time? Um, <laughs> just, is there anything we can do once the zebra mussel is established? Uh, control or eradication, like you say, kind of. Oh, OK. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, so once a population is established, it is possible to remove them, but one, like previously, all it takes is one to reproduce, maybe two, I'm not sure. And um, so um, eradicating them takes, um, you know, just diligency and doing it over and over and over until you get them all out. Sure. Um, okay, we've got another one. Um on uh, a recent detection of zebra mussels in Nova Scotia. So that's our Eastern uh, part of the country. Are there ways to determine uh, the possibility of zebra mussels by water quality monitoring? Um, and how can we monitor our water bodies for changes that indicate the presence of zebra mussels? Um, yeah. Um, by water quality monitoring, they would, um, you would see a drop in, um, Sorry, I can't remember the exact things right now, but you would see a different change. You would see a change in the water composition um, for your water quality monitoring. There would be different calcium. There would be different dissolved minerals because they're ultra filtering the water. Um, and then a way that you'd be able to 
possibly see the see them physically um, is that you could see your shorelines changing without a lot of reason. You could see more plants that didn't have plant life before. Um, I think that's probably probably the easiest way to see it. Sure, sure. And as, as we kind of touched on to eDNA, I think is uh, <laughs> another, yeah. Um, method of, of testing for that. So what have the um, benefits, sorry, what benefits have zebra mussels uh, been shown to have in ecosystems? Um, you know, improved water quality in Lake Erie, which may support some fish populations. Are, are there benefits to having zebra mussel infestations that you are aware? Of? Yeah, I'm sure there, I'm sure there is a nice little sweet spot where they are promoting water clarity and promoting, um, filter filtration of the water and toxins and also not disrupting the ecosystems too much um there probably is that sweet spot i think it's probably a little hard to achieve because um it would be short-lived and then they would probably overtake the native species but there probably is in there somewhere definitely um, and uh, well, maybe just do a couple more before we uh, wrap things up, just to to give you a break. We've had a lot of questions <laughs> come in, which is awesome. Glad to glad to hear there's a lot of interest. Um, in terms of you know more recreational side of things, uh, you know kayaks, canoes, other water vessels. Uh, do you have any recommendations for those type of um, you know equipment? And you know also the cleaning in terms of if you're in a remote area and don't have access to all the tools and and what kind of um, you know, cleaning supplies you could look at using and how to keep that kind of safe for the environment? Sure. Um, the general rule is that um, clean, drain, dry. So even if it's a kayak or a paddle board or something like that, um, wiping it down, um, you could use a chemical cloth that is a kind of like a chemical cleaner, um, generalized to kill things. Um, and then just dry it off really good to make sure there isn't droplets of water hiding in it. Um, and then there is a, they won't live infinitely on your um, paddle boat or canoe. So if you are traveling, letting them sit for two to three weeks, I don't know if it's possible, um, would help anything that was left over to have finish its life cycle. Sure. Yeah, and they can be difficult to see when they're that tiny, tiny little yeah. size uh, villagers. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. And uh, there's there's one comment in here as well, um, kind of on that same vein of recreational uh, boating. Not so much maybe a question, but maybe if you have any uh, thoughts on it. Uh, recreational boat spread is now a major focus. Uh, you kind of touched a bit on that on in your presentation. Um, it seems inevitable that many lakes will be infested. So the, the development of treatments to control zebra mussels um, is kind of the next step. So in terms of uh, AIS monitoring at boat launches, um, you know, being implemented, is that enough or do you have any thoughts on, you know, how we can improve uh, that a bit more? Yeah. Um, yeah, having, um, having individuals at checkpoints for major lakes is always helpful. Um, I thought the conservation canines were a wonderful idea because it was just simple and adorable and cute. Um, but having monitoring at those key points for major weekends or very popular times would definitely help stop the spread just in allowing people to have a professional who's properly trained and knows what they're doing. Um, so yeah, I think putting an effort towards that would be great. Sure. We love, uh, we love, AIS dogs, uh, for sure. <laughs> um, all dogs, but especially AIS dogs. <laughs> um, so uh, another question, uh, can they travel in bathing suits? Um, should bathing suits and water wear be washed in hot water uh, after being in a lake? Um, yes, they can. Um, they can hide anywhere there's water, they can hide. Um, so they can transport on your swimwear. Um, they can transport on your dog if your dog's in the lake. Um, but as far as washing and cleanliness go, it would be a, a shower is hot enough water for all of that to be um, taken care of. So. That's uh, that's definitely concerning. I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a interesting, great question. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I 
it looks like uh, we're done for questions unless anybody else has any last minute kind of uh, thoughts that they want to, you know, anything they want to know about something uh, you may not have guessed before would be a problem with saber muscles. Um, feel free to pop it in, but uh, yeah, any other thoughts, Aaron, uh, on your end, uh, just to wrap things up? Um, just the, thank you for all the questions. That was, that was really great. I'm glad that I got to share some of the things that I worked on with all of you. Um, and yeah, thanks for letting me talk. It was good. Glad to have you, of course. Um, thanks so much for talking to us about this uh, really important topic. Um, so thank you again for presenting. Uh, the webinar was recorded um, and will be posted on our website at invasivespeciescenter.ca for anybody who uh, may wish to kind of revisit some of these conversation topics. Um, and just a reminder to please uh, fill out our survey if you have an opportunity to. Our next webinar will be uh, December 11th at 11 a.m. Uh, and I'll just share my screen. It's, a, it's an important one um, on the, uh, the first detection of, uh, sorry, just let me pull it up, marbled crayfish in Canada, uh, North America, actually. Um, so it's a pretty big, pretty big deal. Um, it's December 11th at 11 a.m. with Brooke Schreier from the Ontario Federation of Anglers and Hunters. Um, so great to, uh, again, great to hear from you, Aaron. So thank you so much for uh, your time today. And uh, thanks for everybody for watching. Thank you. Thank you.